Right, so to continue the discussion of invasive plants, um, we have Tony Lynn Morelli, who's a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey at the Department of Interior's Northeast Science Climate uh, Climate Science Center, excuse me. She's also an adjunct associate professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Tony Lynn's research focuses on translation ecology, uh, translational uh, ecology using field studies, geospatial analyses, ecological modeling, and genetic techniques to facilitate natural resource management and habitat conservation in the face of climate change and land use change. And she also has a particular interest in increasing diversity in uh, ecology and environmental sciences. And when she's not working, um, which I can't imagine she has much spare time, given that, uh, that pile on her plate, but she also enjoys hiking, cooking uh, from her garden, and spending time with her family. She's going to speak to us today about regional efforts to manage forests for invasive species under different scenarios of climate change. Thanks, Dan. Um, thanks, Jim, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, yeah, I'm Tony Lynn Morelli. I'm with the USGS Northeast Climate Science Center. Um, and this talk is also thanks to Bethany Bradley, who's faculty at UMass, and Carrie Brown Lima, who's with the New York Invasive uh, Species Research Institute. And I'll be talking about my collaborations with them throughout the talk. So in the next 15 minutes, I will give a quick overview of how climate is changing in the region and then dig in on how we can um, use monitoring to understand these interactions um, between climate change and invasives, focused on these four topics. And then, um, as mentioned, this sort of uh, collaborative effort we are developing that we hope that um, you might want to get involved in called risk management. This is just a schematic of how climate is changing, and um, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but you can see um, primarily on uh, the right side of this figure is what I'll be focusing on. So we know that um, temperatures have changed just in the last two decades in the Northeast. Um, is there anything? Um, in the Northeast, you can see that there's been um, two degrees uh, Fahrenheit increase in just a couple of decades, which pretty much matches any of the hottest temperatures that we see um, across the U.S. So we've already seen a lot of big changes in northern New England, and those changes are um, expected to increase and continue. So uh, these are the scenarios going into the 2100s. Uh, this is work out of UMass and Northeast Climate Science Center. There's a lot of uncertainty there, of course, but you can see that in general, um, temperatures are going to be increasing and continue to increasing. And what that makes, uh, what that looks like with, for where we're standing, this is from um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, is that Vermont's climate, so, you know, we're standing here in the blue on the left, uh, and the, the, red, uh, the red Vermont is um, higher emissions starting, um, a higher emissions scenario for 2100, and the yellows are lower emissions. And essentially, Vermont's climate kind of marches down to match um, what even Tennessee or even Georgia look like um, right now, which is pretty remarkable. Um, New York has a pretty similar story. We know also that sea level has risen um, in the last century. Uh, you can see that in the big light blue box there, up to almost six inches already, and it's expected, if you've seen from the news, to keep going and going in the next century. The precipitation story is a lot messier. Uh, we've seen already some a slight increase in the last century. Uh, with some more increases uh, expected, but mostly in bigger storms. And that will lead to flooding um, and big storm events, and also occasionally droughts, which uh, we all know now is possible in the Northeast. Um, as um, was said, I came from Ma uh, Western Massachusetts, and we're still in a severe drought. We've had um, been experiencing for months down there. Um, and you hear about stories of, of flooding um, and experiencing them occasionally, them occasionally here yourself. What these temperature and precipitation changes mean um, for us in the Northeast is also a change in the snow season. So we see winter getting shorter and warmer. 
And that's already, again, um, from the National Climate Assessment uh, Report, in the last couple of decades, we've lost 10 of our frost um, frosted days. So we have an increase of 10 days in the frost-free season in just the last two decades. So all of that put together um, is going to have an effect on the forest ecosystem, of course, and I'm here to talk about that from the, through the lens of invasive species and how um, we can think about how we might um, monitor for these changes and the interaction and the exacerbation of invasive species in the face of climate change. So I guess the one good news, I mean, I, 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 most of this is not good news, <laughs> um, is that rising temperatures and um, changing precipitation um, have not been found to directly favor invasive species in general. Um, so there was a, a study that came out, uh, uh, or a suite of species in uh, 2013, and uh, the, um, in general it was found that um, there wasn't really an effect of um, whether you were an invasive or a native species in terms of increasing temperature or changing precipitation. Um, so that, uh, there wasn't a, just a straight uh, influence there. On, on the other hand, many of the species that we know um, and do not love as invasives in this area have, do show um, earlier phenology, essentially. Um, they seem to have uh, priority, there seem to be priority effects. So they come up earlier. And um, with the expectation with climate change that there will be earlier green up, these species then might be, have an advantage in that they already are the earliest ones coming up. And so that's kind of what's shown here in the growing season, that invasives, these invasives are the ones that pop up earliest. And thus, as the temperatures um, move and the seasons change, uh, they're going to be uh, ready to take advantage of that. Another way to think of this is that invasives might actually be more plastic or able to respond to the shifting seasons. So this, um, this kind of little schematic here shows that as climate change sh um, shifts the seasons a little earlier. Invasives maybe in blue are maybe better able to track that. And there is some evidence of this. Um, there was a study, a neat study done in Concord, Mass. Uh, in the early uh, 1900s, late 1800s, 429 flowering species were surveyed and then they were resurveyed 100 years later. Those 400 species are there um, in that big wheel, and um, the red says uh, shows major declines, the pink moderate declines, and you can see um, the majority of the species have shown declines in the last century. The blue are the few one few that have increased. There's some examples of those some of those species there. Uh, so species whose flowering times do not respond to temperature have decreased greatly in abundance over the last hundred years. Um, unfortunately, the invasive speed plants seem to be more responsive to temperature. And even when they separated out invasives from non-natives, so um, all, all, in, all being non-native but some that were actually problematic, um, you can see the invasives were the ones that shifted the most um, over that time period. So the, the invasive plants seem to be more plastic or responsive and um, were able to increase in abundance. Another expectation of how uh, species might respond to climate change is through rain shifts. So it's another thing um, to be keeping an eye on in terms of invasive species. And unfortunately here, invasives have a, a sort of rain shift advantage. So many species are likely to perform poorly within their current ranges given these big climate changes that we're seeing and, and coming our way. And uh, so rain shifts are required. And invasive species have this dispersal advantage, um, thanks to us, in that, uh, and you can see that sort of in these two graphs here, uh, are essentially just saying we move a lot of stuff around. And um, the invasive plants there on the right, you can see in that the green boxes are the deliberate introduction, for example, through ornamental planting and landscaping, um, is how species get around, um, or how these invasives and not just weeds get around. And um, you can see that with Asian longhorn beetle and other examples. 
So if you um, then have uh, the situation where species need to shift their ranges in order to respond to um, track their climate niche, and species are being moved extensively by humans, um, those species that are extensively being moved are going to have more of an ability to track. We also know that um, ranges might be shifting just as uh, sort of climate controls in the sense of um, minimum temperatures uh, get shifted away. So we've seen that with the emerald ash borer. Um, warmer temperatures are increasing forest pest range in abundance in general. And you can see here that um, the emerald ash borer is um, constrained, their habitat is constrained by very cold temperatures. Um, essentially a threshold of negative 30 degrees Celsius, which uh, is essentially disappearing out of the U.S. and something the managers now have to deal with in terms of active management. Similarly, the southern pine beetle is expanding from um, southern U.S. quite quickly. Uh, now is in just recently in Massachusetts as uh, cold extremes retreat northward, um, the southern pine beetle comes right behind. And work from Tony D'Amato here at UVM and Radley Horton out of Columbia is looking at this. This is work um, just still be right, being written up projecting um, southern pine beetles extent given uh, where essentially a climate limit of a minimum temperature is and where it will be going into 2080. And you can see that um, the southern pine beetle is expected to uh, continue to ra expand its range northward. This is sort of absent of, of forest ecology, but um, just based on the climate limits. Similarly, Kudzu um, is expanding northward. Um, I told you this isn't a very uplifting presentation, but um, the, uh, my collaborator, Bethany Bradley and Jenica Allen at UNH, uh, did an analysis looking at um, where are the hot spots for invasion in general, given like what's already there and what could be there, and what is the climate envelope of these different invasive species? They considered invasion risk for 900 plant species, and found this year we're in the hot spot for future plant invasion, um, right there in right here in New England. Um, so I'll keep going. I I promise I'll get to some solutions before my time runs out. Um, so. Uh, we also know with climate change that we're going to see more disturbances. Uh, this picture is an example of um, how understory invasive plants thrive following disturbance. This example from Hurricane Katrina, you know also from Hurricane Irene, I'm sure. And this graph on the right is showing, you know, the, the decreased canopy cover in 2006 from Hurricane Katrina, and then on the bottom uh, that it, that Blackberry then took off in 2006 uh, as an understory growth of, with the lack of canopy cover. Many invasives are disturbance responsive or weedy. They, um, incre with an increase in light availability, they increase in density. And then in general, we know that uh, plants love CO2, um, atmospheric CO2, cli uh, climate change is arising from uh, increased atmospheric CO2, which in general um, is good for plant growth, but is particularly good for invasive plants. So back to the SORT study, and they found that in, in the gray here that uh, terrestrial invasive plants um, have a bigger advantage even than uh, native plants in terms of growth in response to CO2. It also can just make them harder to kill as they um, become more dense. So this is just a quick um, summary of what I just said, and um, I wanted then to move into, well, <laughs> okay, so um, we have earlier green up potentially for invasives, northward shifts for invasives due to increased dispersal or milder winters, better establishment um, of invasives due to increased disturbance, and then increased growth and density due to higher CO2. So I thought maybe you might feel like this. I tried to get my toddler to do this for me. Like, can I take a picture? I got to go. You know, I want to take it. And he said, nah. So anyway, this is a stack photo from the internet. But <laughs> in case you're feeling like that, I wanted to say um, this is why we all came together a few months ago to, to build a group called the Northeast Risk Management Group. And I'm hoping that you all um, 
I've now convinced you to be believers and join too. Um, the RISC stands for Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network. And um, we essentially have the same philosophy that brings you all to the room today, which is that these tissues are bigger than any one of us alone. There's so much in expertise and knowledge out there to share. Um, so we had a workshop, and our workshop objective is to understand the information needs of invasive species managers surrounding climate change, develop a strategy to address those needs through information sharing and targeted research, we have a report, I'll show you the website so you can find it. Um, I've already mentioned Carrie and Bethany, Alex Bryan is also with the Northeast Climate Science Center, our climate modeler, and we had all these organizations present in the room to talk about the, this issue and, um, and to discuss sort of what we can do together. So again, we brought together scientists and managers um, to share knowledge, to have a dialogue and identify um, information needs. Uh, and so some of the research needs we found was to synthesize current um, invasive species and climate change knowledge and provide recommendations, project upcoming species for prevention and early detection, understand how extreme events influence um, establishment and spread, and then establish guidance on how to incorporate climate change and invasive species science into invasive species management planning. Um, and some actions that uh, we identified that managers were already taking are modifying the list of early detection species based on those likely to expand their range. So thinking about this in terms of monitoring, actively managing pathways of invasion that are likely to bring new invasive species, so thinking about it again from adding new invasive species perspectives, um, changing the management season, field trees starting earlier and ending later, Prioritizing invasive species management in areas or habitats that are likely to be vulnerable to extreme weather. Incorporating climate change information into outreach materials. So these are all things that states and organizations in this area are already doing. And then establishing dem demonstration plots to show climate change impacts. There was a great deal of interest in monitoring and research on invasive species spread following an extreme weather event. Can we synthesize research that address this issue? Um, can we use these data to predict future invasions and effective management strategies following extreme events? So can we take advantage of these things that are already happening so that we can try to learn as they happen more and more in the future? How are effective treatment periods for invasive species shifting? Um, what are other agencies doing to improve early detection in the face of climate change? These are all questions that, could, um, that are being posed that monitoring could inform. And I did want to just point out that Jenica Allen at UNH is creating a state-level watch list, state-level watch list of invasive plants that could colonize under current and future climate that could be used to um, improve monitoring. So we had a bunch of um, next steps uh, suggested by the group, and we've done a couple of them already. We've formalized the work group. I gave it a name, a fancy acronym. We have a listserv. It's up to 100 people already. We could make it 300 um, tomorrow. <laughs> and um, we use that to share information, to share papers, uh, to share uh, meeting opportunities. And then we're really um, focusing also on this, um, looking to have, build a regional conference or a working group meeting next year. So um, stay in touch for that. So finally, um, if you wanted to get involved, uh, you could join our Northeast Risk Management Listserv. Um, it's that. If you wanted to participate in the next meeting or conference, you could go to join the Listserv and you could learn about it. And then if you wanted to um, join a working group or our advisory group, you could um, join our Listserv. So um, here's my contact information and um, our, West, our website gives a lot more information as well. Thank you. We have time for question or two. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll have to um, ask my collaborator and get back to you. <laughs> Right, maybe you could um, highlight for us uh, some uh, connections between this work and any other regional um, uh, issues. Are, are, are there um, links between this effort and other regional approaches? Um, 
Yeah, so um, we were really surprised to find that actually there wasn't already kind of a regional invasive species collaboration going on in this area. Um, in the southwest, there are already some established efforts, and there's um, some national uh, there's a national network that we're going to be loosely affiliated with. But for the most part, there wasn't sort of something already on the ground, and we will be reaching out. We both, uh, several of us work in the West, so we're trying to learn from efforts out there, especially, certainly with forest pests. There's a lot of experience with bark beetles, and so there's a lot to learn from those other regional efforts. Thanks.